Like you said, I'm Eric Wise, Software Craftsmanship Guild. Uh, we are a startup in the Akron Global Business Accelerator right down the road here on South Main Street. Woo! Yeah, we got some accelerator people in here. So, my background, uh, I've been a .NET developer pretty much same since it came out. Uh, when I started the guild, I had well over 10 years of experience building software. I had worked for startups. I worked for a startup called Heartville Group down in Canton, Ohio. Uh, they were a pet insurance startup. And I worked my way up to director of application development there. And they recently had a successful exit, so we were really happy for them. Now, when I was in charge of that development team, I had a real problem. We, every time we went to grow, we were looking for software developer talent. And we couldn't find it. And when I go out and talk to my peers, I go to conferences, things like that, everywhere I go, we can't find developers. We can't find developers. People that apply, yeah, we get some applications, but they really don't know what they're doing. And we'll go to the colleges, and we'll get college students in here. Sorry. We'll get some college students in here. And the college students, while they knew a lot of theory, they didn't really know how to do anything. They didn't know about source control. They didn't know about agile methodologies. They didn't know how to work in teams. And, you know, I kept hearing this over and over and over again. And in my own hiring journey, I actually took two young women out of our call center who were making... I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Is that a problem? Not much. Close the mic. Close the mic. Close. There. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Sorry. I'm not used to working with a mic. I just yell at my students. <laughs> so, so, you know, in a, in, in a fit of desperation, I basically went down to our call center and I talked to the call center manager. I said, hey, just find me two of the smartest people you can in the call center who know our product and who actually want to learn how to, how to write code. And, and I'll just teach them. And I took two young ladies. Uh, one had a fine arts degree. Uh, the other one actually didn't have a degree at all. And I started teaching them SQL. I started teaching them some C-sharp so they could do automated testing. And within six months, they were productive members of my team. Light bulb. You don't need a CS degree to be successful in IT. And we know this because, you know, we, we hear the stories about Bill Gates and all those guys that, that didn't finish school and, and they did fine. What you do need to be successful as a developer is a logical mind and a lot of grit. You need to be able to dedicate yourself to it. You need to be able to not give up and, and just really hammer away at problems. But, you know, back when I was learning the program, everything was running in the DOS prompt. So it's like, you know, I could learn one language and I could write a program and it would work just fine and everybody was happy. Well, today we've got the web. And now if I want to write a real application on the web, I have to know some kind of database language. I have to know, so SQL, for example. I have to know a server-side language. So I have to learn Java, I have to learn Ruby, I have to learn C-sharp, I have to learn something like that. I also have to know HTML. I have to know JavaScript. I have to know CSS. So, you know, there's all these people out there who are very intelligent, and they want to learn to program, but they can't. Because they're out there on the internet, and they're trying to find resources to learn the code. And there's things like Code Academy and stuff out there that walk you through tutorials. But it's a really bad experience for the neophyte, because writing real code isn't like running a tutorial. And then because you only learn one thing at a time, and it doesn't matter whether you're learning online or learning at a college, you might take a Java class in year one, you might take a database class in year three, but you never really learn how to bring everything together and build a real application. So how are these people going to learn? And then the internet's even worse because we all know that the internet never forgets. So every time you go out there and you're searching for help with your code and you're working on your own, you're coming across resources that are five years old and they're not even relevant anymore. And teaching at the Guild, I've created slide decks that, I swear to God, before I've gotten to use them in my class, the framework has changed. And I have to go back and redo my deck. So, we don't have a prayer to keep it up. So, I came up with this idea for the Software Craftsmanship Guild. And the whole point of this was to go out and find people who were really dedicated to learning code. And I came up with an assessment test. It's a logic and reasoning test. It has some math in it, too. And I went out and gave it to a bunch of computer science students. 
And I took that baseline score, and then I added 20% to it. And I basically said, I don't care where you come from, what your background is, if you are passionate about learning to code, and you're smart enough, and you can communicate well enough, you come here to Akron, Ohio, and we will teach you how to do full stack development. And we're going to use the master apprentice model. We're going to put you in a room with people who have more than 10 years of experience, and we're going to teach you a few hours a day, and the rest of the day you're going to be ready to code. And we're going to walk you through the whole stack so that by the time you're done with our program, you know how to do everything to build an application. You're, you're employable as a junior developer. So breaking into Lean Startup, I said, okay, I have this idea. And every founder's story, you know, this, this is the new American dream, the new American fairy tale. You know, somebody has an idea, and then some work happens, and we usually have a nice montage. And then all of a sudden there's profitability, and there's drama, and everybody's trying to figure out how to divide the spoils. Well, the work part is the part that's really boring, but the part that we need to go into. And the Lean Startup, like any methodology, I don't know, can I see a show of hands? How many of you have read the Lean Startup? Only a couple people. So I can totally make this up and the rest of you aren't going to know. <laughs> Great. So, Lean Startup has a couple different ideas behind it. Like any methodology, applying it to your real world scenario, there's no such thing as a silver bullet. So, here's the things that I discovered that I really liked. And first I want to talk about Lean. Because Lean does not mean cheap. That's not what Lean Startup is. To me, lean means being able to come up with a hypothesis, and a lot of times many hypotheses, because the business is very complicated, and then coming up with very quick ways to validate. So we call it build, validate, learn. And when I started the business, my first hypothesis was there's not enough software developers in the world. And that was very easy. Bureau of Labor Statistics, talking to employers, yeah, there's not enough, not enough software developers. Hypothesis 2 was a little bit trickier. Hypothesis 2 was that companies would be willing to hire people just because they know what they're doing. <laughs> now, luckily, we've discovered that's true too. We've had people come through our cohorts with a variety of backgrounds. We've had people with college degrees in fine arts. We've had mechanical engineers. We've had teachers. We've had linguistics people. Uh, we've had, even had some high school students with no college education at all because they don't like sitting in a classroom. And people are hiring them. We've actually placed 90% of our students, which is great. Makes us very happy. The third hypothesis was that companies would pay us on time. <laughs> now we're getting last because those of us that are business owners in the room, we understand that that tax receivable can be, can be rather painful. So the first model that I created for the guild was that the students would just pay enough to cover the lab fee. So they pay enough to cover the hardware, we give them a laptop, we give them all the tools they need to develop. And then we would place them on the back end and, they, and then the companies would pay us for that placement just like a recruiter. Well, in reality, after the first cohort, we got people hired, but then I discovered, well, um, it's a 12-week program, so I'm waiting 90 days to get any money at all, and then they're going to work, and then I'm invoicing the company, and the company doesn't want to pay me until they're sure the person's going to work out, and now I'm six months from getting any money. Uh, that, that, that ain't going to work. So, you know, immediately we can pivot. Second hypothesis I had also wrong, so I'm going to stand up here and tell you how wrong I am all the time. Second hypothesis I had is that my typical student would be somebody who already had an IT background of some kind. They would be system administrators that wanted to change. They would be programmers whose skills were obsolete and that, and that they needed retooled. Not the case. Only about 15% of our students have any IT background at all. What we discovered is that there is a significant portion of the population who already has a college degree in the wrong thing. And now they've racked up sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars in college loan debt, and they have no jobs prospects. They're wearing their name on their shirt. Or even sometimes we have students who come to us, you know, who are in very successful fields. We've had mechanical engineers come through, people working for Ford, 
And, and, and they come to us and they say, I hate my job. What do I do? I discovered development. I'd like to do development. And all these people, to a T, say, I want to learn to program. There is no way I'm going back to college for another two years and spending $60,000. Not doing it. So one of the first things I learned, being open to invalidating my own hypothesis and my own ideas, I didn't even know who my customer was. Because I thought my customer was somebody with IT experience. My actual customer is somebody between the age of 25 and 40 who typically has some college education, is very smart, very motivated, and hates their job. <laughs> and wants a better life. That is who my customer is. And it was because I was willing to test this and willing to look at the market and, and, and willing to be wrong that I was able to pivot so quickly and change the way I do things. Third supposition. I thought that most of my students would come from this region. They'd be in my backyard. They'd be unemployed, living over in Kent, whatever, and they'd want to come over to the Guild Learn program. What I've discovered is that 60 to 70 percent of our students are coming from around the country. Yes, absolutely. So in my current cohort, you know, we have a gentleman from San Diego. We have a couple people from Michigan. We have a gentleman from Idaho. We have a young lady from Atlanta. In every cohort we've done, this is our fourth and fifth right now, more than half of our people have been from out of state. So I'm really a big fan of Northeast Ohio. I grew up in Ohio, and, and I love this region. And now all of a sudden I have an opportunity where I am bringing brains into the region. And that's not a story we hear very often. So that makes me happy. So supposition that we would be local, completely false. And then when people get here and they start learning and they explore our region, now people are deciding that Ohio is actually a pretty good place to live. We are two or three students at a time depopulating the city of Chicago. <laughs> and, 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 and it disappoints me, and I, and, and I want to work with, with people in this region to, to evangelize Ohio more. Because I tell you, these guys from Chicago, they come in here and they learn, and then they go out and they start interviewing with Northeast Ohio companies, and they get a job offer. What's the next thing they do? They go look for housing. And they come back to me and they go, my God, Eric. I got this great place downtown, and it's like 700 bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they're like, you know, you could have touched this place in Chicago for $2,500. So they're going to have a better life, they're going to have a better tra career trajectory, and, and they're going to have better income, more disposable income. Win, 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 win. Great. So that's been long. Let me grab my notes here, because I'm, I'm dancing too much. I'm doing all for you. So, another, another, another bad assumption. Uh, I've got a whole list of things there. I've only been in business six months. So, companies I thought would be the primary revenue driver. I, I honestly thought that, that, that recruiting fees would be, would be the number one driver of talent. What I came to find out is that nobody likes recruiters. <laughs> Nobody likes it. So, but then I'm, I'm kind of stuck because I said, well, I'm asking people to pay $10,000 for 12 weeks of training because you're being trained by somebody with more than 10 years of IT experience and us, we don't come cheap. So I was actually really terrified at that point because you know, if I can't get companies to pay me for these people, are people actually going to pay us that kind of money with no student loaning, because even though we're registered with the state of Ohio as an education institution, we can't get into the student loan program for two years. So I'm like, wow, we got this cash flow problem. I got to change the model. And if I start charging people 10 k nobody's going to come. Completely wrong. Completely wrong. We changed our tuition. Everybody has to pay us half up front, half at the, half at the end. And enrollment numbers didn't dip at all. Okay, I was happy I was wrong, right? <laughs> but then we needed to change the way we, we do business with employers. Because I said, well, you know, it's, it's nice when employers pay us, 
you know, just like a recruiter, but that's, you know, employers don't like that, and, and it's, and it's kind of it's greedy. So, adding that to all my students coming in from out of state, I said, well, I want to encourage these people to stay here. So what we've done is we've gone out to employers, and instead of saying, hey, this is a recruiting fee, we, we've said it's a tuition reimbursement. So employers now, we basically broke them into three tiers. Tier one employers, they, they pay us the largest fee, and, and we take that fee and we deduct it from the tuition. So they basically get a signing bonus if they stay here in Northeast Ohio and work here with our companies and stay in this region. And tier two, they get in about week nine. Tier three, you don't pay anything, but you know the best students are probably going to be gone by that. So that's worked out really well, and it's completely different than the model that I imagined when I started. I had this huge idea about what students would be like, where they come from, who is going to pay me. All wrong. All wrong. So this whole lean startup methodology thing, build, measure, learn. I came up with an idea, I launched it, I tried it out, I learned. Immediately when I learned, I pivoted. And I pivoted again. And I pivoted again. And uh, long story short, we're profitable after six months. Makes me very happy. You know, I hope that, uh, I, I kind of just want to do a Q&A because I'm a teacher. I like to hear this feedback. Does anybody, does anybody have any particular questions about, about how I made these decisions or what was going on behind them or anything about the guild? L.A. Cheese? What's your, what's, up? what's your yield every year as far as how many students you're putting out in the workforce? Well, because, because we're a mentorship program and people need personal attention, uh, the maximum class size we will support is 12. Uh, right now, we are spending zero dollars on marketing. Uh, all of our students have found us online. We, our mentors go out and answer questions on Quora and Reddit and places where people are learning code. We just help people out for free. And uh, max will take is 12. We're, we're seeing about eight .NET cohort people and five or six Java people right now. I'm, I'm looking to hire that guys in the area, and uh, you, you, you're hitting the nail on the head. There's not, there's not enough people out there. So I'm just curious, like what your yield is, and how you're looking to scale, and the, you know, the. Uh, yeah. Um, right now, our yield with our current instructor staff, we run two cohorts. So we got a Java open source MySQL cohort, and then we've got .NET, uh, C Sharp, ASP.NET, and SQL Server. Those are, if you look at the enterprises in the area. That's pretty much where all the jobs are, so that's what we're targeting. If tomorrow Ruby is the number one language in the area, then we'll teach Ruby. But right now, that's not the case. Uh, we do three classes a year, 12 weeks each, and that's going to put out yeah, about 72 students a year, which is a drop in the bucket. Bureau of Labor and Statistics says there's going to be a million open programming positions in 2020. And the thing people don't realize is how few computer science graduates we're putting out. You know, sometimes people ask me, are you competing with the colleges? No. No, I'm not. Number one, we, our, my student demographic is completely different than theirs. And number two, Ohio State University. 40,000 students. They graduate about 200 IT students a year. Companies in Ohio could hire every single computer science graduate that comes out, and we're not going to meet the demand. So, you know, right now I'm getting a good chuckle when I, when I call on companies and they say, yeah, we only hire people with CS degrees. I'm like, good, good luck with that. <laughs> so what's your plans to scale? Uh, right now, uh, our business, we, we were in the validation stage. So I, I created all this curriculum. I discovered that it works. What we're doing is effective. We're starting to look at venture capital. So I don't know if there's any VCs in here. Yeah, maybe you want to talk to me later. But um, the business when I started was self-funded. I, I basically cashed out my 401k and, and lived off it for six months. And, uh, you know, putting it together and making sure it works. Uh, because the product we're selling, it, it's not really a training, it, it's us in the curriculum and the, the way we do things. So scaling that, uh, we're basically, we're, we're looking at, you know, do we want to do more locations in Ohio or even outside of Ohio? Um, we're also looking at maybe doing some online training. Uh, I'm not really sure about that yet, 
uh, because I feel like the in-person, face-to-face experience is the most effective way to learn. So we're going to be a little cautious about that. But this summer, if anybody is involved in education, uh, we are looking at doing some training the trainer for teachers. We would like to train high school and junior high teachers how to teach students to get fundamentals in the world. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so, so we're looking at partnering with some of the school districts in the area, and, and it, I've already got some companies that might want to sponsor to make it free for the teachers, and, and hopefully be able to offer them some of our curriculum. Because, like I said, you go out to the internet, everything's everywhere. It's a big problem learning on your own. We basically distilled everything down to here's step by step how you learn to build a full stack application. So, other questions? Right there in the back. Sorry, I can't see you back there because of my, just, just yell my name. Hey, Eric! How are you doing? Um, how many data points or conversations would you have before you would give it? One? <laughs> 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 um, no, uh, seriously, it, it depends on what it is. Uh, when it was working with employers and what that relationship would look like, um, it, it was dozens of data points. I, I went around the area, I met with a lot of business leaders, I talked to them, I used different words, I, I started keeping track of you know, the word recruitment fee. Naughty word. We don't want to use that word. Tuition reimbursement. Very positive word. So, um, yeah, usually two or three data points, but we, we basically, in the first in the first six months, we, we pivoted two or three times our model. And, you know, like I said, it, it just was a matter of I found out that my customer wasn't who I thought it was. And, and I found out that the business is while they are supportive and they want to hire our people, they don't want us to be tech systems. So I shouldn't have made them. I apologize if anybody works for tech systems. <laughs> yes, sir. If you replace somebody, is there a healing out period between uh, you know them trying out the guy or, or girl before they you know they do the reimbursement thing or how does that work as far as quality? And well, we 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 invoice them after 30 days. So by the time we invoice you and you pay us, you basically do about 60 days to to figure out if you like it. And now that we're on tuition reimbursement, the students already paid us, so we're cutting them a refund, so our cash flow isn't, isn't really damaged by that. Okay, but as an employer, you're, you're protected a little bit, you have a little bit of a buffer to, to feel out the person making they're gonna work out. Yeah. Yeah, we're also exploring doing contract to hire, but I'm a three-man shop, and I don't really want to manage all that going, so. Anything else? Can't see? We good? I'll shut up then.